Welcome everybody to Life on Mars, Mars Base podcast. I'm Alex, CEO and founder of Mars Base. And in this episode, we'll be talking about angel investment because a lot of people in the technology industry, eventually they make it to the investment landscape, either as a side thing or as a full-time job. So we'll be talking to Liz Dan Carroll, who she is based in Seattle right now, but she has worked long enough in technology startups and big companies in the Bay Area, like Tecnorati, Verizon, and Pandora, among many others, to know what's the real deal when choosing startups and when choosing technological startups. So um, we'll be talking about how to get into the angel investment, not only sector, but also in the mentality, how to shake off the gatekeeping in the industry, how to shake off the imposter syndrome. How does one become an angel investor? Is it after a certain amount of deals? Is it after a certain amount of money you have invested? Is it after you announce it publicly on LinkedIn? We don't know. We'll be talking about this and much more with Liz. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did it. Let's go. Liz, hello. How are you doing? Welcome to Life on Mars. Thank you. Uh, good morning, because you're based in Seattle. Seattle, Washington. It's 10 a.m. my time. 10 a.m. So we appreciate that you're having coffee while I'm having a beer over here. I so, know. you know, great. I really wanted to have this conversation. We've been, we've known each other. Let's go back to when we met. Actually, we met, we met in Barcelona uh, in 2017 when you and Dorian were visiting uh, Barcelona. We hosted him at a Star Plan event, Barcelona. And then we proceeded to go out every night and close all the bars in Barcelona. That was freaking fantastic. And we, we became friends for life. But, you know, you've got an extensive career in, in product and in innovation in Silicon Valley. You've worked at companies like Verizon. You've got like uh, a, lot of com a lot of companies that we will not be covering that part because we will be covering today the angel investing part, right? Because I think that you and I have a very parallel history with angel investing. And we have a lot of people here in Barcelona that don't know how to get into that, right? So yeah. let's let's talk a little bit about your background. Like, what did you think before going into angel investing? How did you perceive it? How did you perceive that world as an outsider? Um, well, you know, I started working in Silicon Valley in 1993. And so I knew what venture capital was. I had been at companies that, you know, I'd been through an IPO. I had been through other like stuff like that. So to me, it was a very uh, official specific set of skills that you needed to have. Um, you know, like you needed to go to business school and, you know, all those, all the VCs are very important people and running around doing the deals. And, you know, I just didn't picture myself. That way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in my career, I had always just picked, I usually worked on consumer facing products and, you know, almost all of them were way too early for their time. Like I worked at a company that was just like YouTube, but it wasn't YouTube and it was four years before YouTube got founded. So uh, yeah, they won. But I thought, you know, video is going to be huge. I was right. Um, the first company I ever worked for was a company called General Magic. And they're famous because, you know, the people that worked there went on to found eBay, uh, Android, um, Web TV, uh, the iPod and iPhone. So, you know, again, they were making a handheld digital product that I was like, that totally makes sense. And we were 10 years too early. So, you know, the, the way I really got started with angel investing <clears throat> was um, I read Jason Calacanis' book, Angel. And the thing that I thought was so, well, there's a lot of things I think are great about that book, but he kind of just makes you see like, it's not that anyone can, anyone can do it, right? If you've got good gut, if you've got a good gut feeling about stuff and you're willing to do a little bit of work, like, you know, um, you know, he talks in his book about, you know, he'd meet with with people, you know, pitching a company and they would say that they had a prototype and they really didn't. Like, you have to sort of push a little bit um, on people. But, you know, again, working in Silicon Valley for, what, 18 years or something, you can smell bullshit. It's everywhere. So I thought, OK, well, I've got a good nose That's for a bullshit. tough statement, <laughs> but I'm buying it. Yeah. Yeah, even and, uh, there. Like, you know, I mean, bullshit is yeah. just bigger there because everything is bigger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just whoo, bullshit, bullshit. And, um, <laughs> and I also had deep connections in Silicon Valley, which is good, right? Because at the, especially at the time before the pandemic, it was considered that most people were going to go there because that's where all the VC money was. So, you know, there was better deal flow. But also I liked in his book, he just talks about really it's gambling. You're just gambling some money. 
And instead of gambling it, you know, in Vegas, you're gambling it on people who have a dream. And if you fund their dream, you know, you could maybe fund some stuff for yourself. And I really liked that idea. I liked the idea of putting money into like, you know, at this point, if I had a great idea, of course I would go and hustle and, and make it happen. But at this point, seeing other people that really, really want to hustle and they just need a break. I, I like that a lot. I also feel like I tend to pick uh, founders that aren't like your Y Combinator founders, just because those guys are fine. The Y Combinator cohorts are going to be fine. They're going to get their money. Um, I like it when it's a little more scrappy and I've had, uh, so anyway, one of the things that Jason says in his book is you should just try a bunch of little bets. Correct. Point. Like 10 bets in a year, something like that. No bigger than 10 grand per 10 grand. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think all my first couple were through his syndicate and they were like $2,000, $5,000. And it was a great through his right. syndicate, right? Through his syndicate. His syndicate yeah. Yeah, and great. then I got into a couple of other ones, like Zach Colius has a syndicate. He's a smart guy. Um, and then a guy that I knew kind of, actually through the same way that we met you through that, um, I can't remember the name of the group that like sets up, uh, you know, people with similar skills overseas, you know, on, on um, Oh yeah, like uh, nomadic mentors or nomadic something like that. Nomadic mentors, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, met yeah. Guy. And so he has a syndicate, and you know the thing oh, that nice. I at the at the beginning when I first started, uh, I liked the syndicate because I felt like okay, Jason did all the due diligence, or Zach Colius did all the due diligence, or this other guy Tyler Willis did it all. And then you know as I got my feet wet, because angel investing, like you know, sometimes it's really busy and sometimes nothing is happening at all. And it's a slow, it's a slow exit if you get an exit, right? So, you know, after I had all the initial excitement of making these little bets um, and, you know, then nothing kind of happens for a while. Uh, and I would go to demo days. I went to Jason's demo days. I also backed um, Arlen Hamilton at yep. Backstage. We're going to go into that. Yeah, that's a good awesome. one. <laughs> but yeah, she has demo days. So like, you know, there, there was, there's stuff to do, but then other times there's nothing to do. And that's when I, you know, I do know a lot of people in Silicon Valley and people started when they found out that we were um, investing, they would approach us. And that was fun because then that's me doing my own due diligence and me having sort of more, it's just, you know, it's up to me. It's up to me to make the decision. So that was fun. So it was, it was a, Jason's book sort of sets that out, like do, do little things. And then, you know, once you get your, your sea legs, you can start making bigger bets that you are you know, more fully informed about. And so that's sort of what happened. And it's been four years. Yeah. And what I like about his book is that precisely it's not, no, I mean, you might like him or not. I mean, he's a love or hate guy, right? Oh. But the book is no bullshit. Like it's pretty clear, straightforward. It's like, here's how I did it. He shares everything. I like it because it's not the typical, you know, obscure book with a lot of like, you know, super verbose and everything, but that says a lot, but doesn't really say anything. That one is like facts. It's conversational because he and he's like, yeah, a lot of people think I'm an asshole. And, you know, looking back on it, I was pretty hard on some early startup guys. And so I've I've mellowed a little bit in that. Yeah. Thing, but yeah. I like being a non Silicon Valley person. And even though <clears throat> I mean, the main reason I started working in Silicon Valley is so uh, long ago is because I just live here, you know, like he, I knew someone that worked at Apple and, you know, it you just happened to be there. I happened to be there. <laughs> And he was, and so I don't feel like I am a Silicon Valley person. I don't have an engineering degree. And I, well, I went to Berkeley, but I didn't go to Stanford. And he's kind of like that too. He has this outsider mentality where, you know, this was a club and he kind of, you know. He yeah, because he's from New York. I think he was raised somewhere close to New York. And he had to kind of like punch his way into the Silicon Valley group yeah. because he was an outsider, right? And my next question is, if it was hard for him as an outsider, how about you, like, you know, being a woman, because like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I don't know, like, there was no role models for angel investors being women, yeah. right? It's still main, mainly most white men, right? So how do you, yeah. and where did you find the inspiration for you to become an angel investor? Oh, well, I mean, I have a, I have a strong point of view that, you know, the, 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 the power hierarchies and systems that exist now, um, as soon as the people that 
aren't benefiting from that have the money, then we'll control the system. So it's not like smash the patriarchy, but that would be fine with me if it got Fight like the system. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I've always known that whoever's got the money has the power. And so, Correct. you know, it never occurred to me, I shouldn't do this. It's like, I have to do this because I want more people like me and like you, you're not a Silicon Valley guy, you know, no. just like the, the system favors who it favors. And I want to create my own system to favor. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like, there's, uh, there's not. I mean, and and the lack of diversity, it just goes beyond the, the you know, the gender gap because, like, you know, the, the, now there's the racial diversity, but like, diversity in background and social status, that's something that hasn't been around, and it's still, you know, as an investor, at least in in Spain, I feel like the outsider because I'm pretty vocal about being super left wing person. Like, pretty much every every investor out there is just super right wing or like at, at least you know center right because. It's okay to say it publicly, right? But yeah. if you're left, you're a socialist and you're like pro Venezuela and things like that, and you're like a communist and you eat babies. Like, so I think that there's no diversity there. Like, there's no incentive for me to want to belong to this club. So, yeah. And also, having seen like the different waves, so there was like Web 1 0, Web 2 0, I don't know what we're on now, but yeah. <laughs> you know, you still see the same types of, like, for example, Um, at Verizon, I was doing some 3D slash VR stuff and everyone's really into VR yeah. and really into it. And I was like, this isn't going to get mainstream because the headsets are clunky and it's kind of a solitary experience. It's not going to get big probably till like 2022. But all the people that were super big into VR, as it sort of became clear over the years that, you know, there wasn't the boom wasn't quite here yet, then those are all the same people that got into crypto. And it was kind of like that, you know, back in the day when everything was, you know, websites and then suddenly everyone's like, I'm a mobile designer. Like there's these waves where the same people sort of, the same type of person will jump on what they think is the moneymaker or, you know, the, the popular thing. And that's not the same as a great ideas in my opinion. And actually, so before like getting into angel investing, right? Um, as an outsider, as I was saying, it feels like it's so complicated. It's convoluted, convoluted because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of things that you can read. There's no documentation. There's no like ABC. You gotta do this. And if somebody's selling you courses on how to angel invest, that's actually shit you don't want to read, right? So it's like no one's sharing the good stuff, which is weird because then it's like, how do I learn from that? in a world that is not very inviting, right? So that being said, um, where did you find information as to how to become an accredited investor? What is a business angel? What kind of checks you have to write to become a business? Like, is there any threshold, you know, app from which you become an angel investor and below that you're just an amateur investor? Um, well, how did you find out about all of that? I mean, I mean really, it was Jason's book. I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah. And then, you know, he there's, for example, um, uh, if you go to, I believe it's Y Combinator, I think, you know, they have a bunch of information on their website that's like, here's what a normal term sheet is. Here's what a safe. Yeah, you know, templates. Yeah. And yeah, and, and those templates, and I found those super, super useful. I also went... So once I decided that this is my new personality, this is or my new my my new passion, uh, I took a course at UC as part of the uh, Haas School of Business called I don't know it's like uh, Executive Education and it was like a a five day like hardcore like 8 a.m. to basically 8 p.m. course where you know each day you would talk about different kinds of stuff. Interestingly, there was a ton of people, not a ton, but at least a handful of people from Tiger Global, which you know now is kind of famous. But at the time I'm like, oh, Tiger Global, huh. And uh, basically you learn um, sort of how can deals can get structured. There's stuff that like, as an angel investor, I probably don't need to know, like what's a tranche and- Yeah, Come stuff like that. Yeah, but like, but it was it was fascinating, and I I felt like that course because it's very like, uh, it's a serious course for serious like real investors. Like there was a lot of corporate investors there. Um, I felt like at least I know the size of what there is to know, and I know the pieces that I don't know. Like we broke into groups, and we had to do this math thing, and you know, I let I let the guys from Portugal do that. They were better at that than I was. But I definitely, but at least I know what there is to know. I know that there's calculations that get, you know, that, that, and you can spin them a couple different ways. 
I know about some of the legal stuff. I know about restructuring debt, you know, these things. I know, uh, I know that they, I know that they're things and, you know, you can learn anything. You just read, but yeah, it was Jason's book and this UC Berkeley course. And then again, like, I I feel like when you read the blogs of like VC VCs, like, you know, you've got uh, Fred Wilson and these other, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, Ben Horowitz's blog. I don't think they're useful for the angel investor because at my level, we're dealing with very different things. Yeah. Like, for them, angel investing is like 50 grand to 50 companies a year. It was like, well, definitely it's way beyond my budget, right? Well, <laughs> You're also, here and we're here. <laughs> I sort of feel like they, uh, you know, they want a proven track record where as an angel, you're, you're, you're rolling the dice on, I mean, it's, I have, I have, I have invested based almost on just a PowerPoint deck. Nice. And you know, I mean, of course it would be, it, it would be uh, very inappropriate for, you know, Andreessen Horowitz to do that. And nowadays, yeah, but back in the day, that's how you raise money. But um, you raise a really good point here. Let me just, uh, let me just uh, highlight this. Because actually you and I separately, we both started investing through a syndicate because obviously they maybe they might be getting commissions because it's a carry, there's like a management fee and whatever, but at least you don't get the the overhead of having to manage all of that paperwork. It's kind of like you're outsourcing oh, that yeah. shit. You're paying them so that you can learn with them, right? It is an expensive investing. Oh. I did a couple of deals back in 2015, and I knew it was kind of like a way for me to get used to investing and to like wire that kind of money, uh, which I hadn't done before learn the ropes, learn the terminology and whatnot. But it was it was difficult because it was expensive. And then I started to get invited into insider or people in the know rounds that are like, hey, you know, I'm raising some small money just to test this. It's like 80 grand, something like that. If you want cheap, like, I don't know, five grand, something like that. And then that's the real deal. When you start getting this kind of deal flow, but it doesn't come straight away. How long did it take you to start getting this kind of Deal flow. That's a good question. I mean, probably. I only ask it, good questions, Liz. So, we need to <laughs> get this right off the bat. It's only good questions on the podcast. On this podcast. <laughs> um, Sorry, I go ahead. Probably a year, and part of that also was a um, year only. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, me telling people that that's what I was doing. So then the deal flow comes your way because you know people are like, oh, you invest. You know, I know someone that's raising, or actually, you know, you told me that you were investing, you know, last year, and now I have this thing, you know, let's invite you. So now, I mean, Correct. we have this, I have a spreadsheet about uh, what my investment is, how much, and um, if it was through a syndicate, and who's syndicate, or if it's direct. And now, almost eighty percent of my investments are um, direct with the company. Partially, that's because you know I do um, the pro rata, I do a follow on investment, so you know that winds up taking. You know, the over the deals probably half and half. You know, direct and syndicate, but the syndicate deals are lower, and I don't, yeah. I don't always do the the, the um, pro rata follow on investment. So <clears throat> that's been great. And in fact, you know, Angel List. I got on Angel List early, just again to sort of try to figure things out. And you know, they are pushing syndicates really hard, but I don't need them as much anymore. No, but they're still good. I just keep them in my radar because they complement the deal flow I might not get, right? So oh, I still yeah. do once a year, twice a year, one of this because it's like, wow, this is really good. Why didn't I get it, right? I don't want to miss out on this one. I know yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah. be more I, expensive, still, but I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm still there. I also think it's interesting to see, like, for example, you'll see trends. Like, you know, um, for a while, like, there were so many self-driving, self everything little deals yep. coming up and that's kind of abated now you're seeing a lot of health tech like cell biology dna stuff um and it, it, I, I do like getting uh, a, a big view of what are the companies now that people are excited about raising money about whether or not i mean i don't feel like i am ever really going to invest in healthcare because to me it's just Number one, the health insurance uh, industry in the United States. I feel like we'll do whatever they tell us to do. Like you could have the best idea in the world, and yeah. if they're not on board, you'll never make it because all the doctors and everyone is sort of tied up with the insurance company. So I just, I'm not yeah. going to go into that because I don't, I don't know enough. I don't know what I, I don't know enough. 
and there's but there, that's a big sector and you see um you just like uh, now yeah you just you start seeing trends in what is who is raising money and i also read i read inside business or maybe it's inside vc i have i read pitch book um, there's another, yep. there's a couple other like VC, uh, sort of investing newsletters. And those are really helpful because again, you're starting to see number one, who's raising money, how much and from whom. So like I started seeing tiger global, I don't know, like a year ago. I mean, it was sort of like when you first saw, um, SoftBank, you're like, wait, what? Like you guys are gave $500 million, like to the just watching their investment patterns, because you could see when someone raced around, they would report who had participated. And it was like, what are those guys doing? <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, you just pattern match. Yeah, which is something that, you know, after you've been a while investing, you start seeing like, oh, okay, now th this is the kind of valuation, you know, uh, valuations are completely off the charts in, in, in the US, especially in the Bay Area. But here, like for a pre-seed round, like, you know, 1.5 million, something like that. It's sort of acceptable, minimum tick size. It's like this and that. However, I want a hard question here. Uh, let's open up a little bit. Imposter syndrome. Did you get it when you started investing? Like, am I really an investor? Can I put it on LinkedIn? Do I really want to, you know, advertise me as like promote me as an investor? Uh, am I investing enough money to be called an investor or not really? I, I still got it. And I've been investing for six years now. So it's like, am I really an angel investor when I never put more than 10 grand in a company? And I don't yeah. know, like something like this. I still get yeah. it a lot. I, I, I know what you mean. Um, I mean, you know, being a, a woman in Silicon Valley, you kind of, I kind of always have it. Like, it's always just like sitting on my shoulder. Like, do you belong here? And you get treated that way too. Like, do you belong here? Like, so really? I kind of, I take that feeling and I kind of, I use it to make me like show up yeah. harder, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, especially at the point where I'd invested, I don't know, less than $10,000. Uh, sure. I wasn't running around telling people I was an investor. Then once I got up to, you know, I don't know, more, uh, yeah. and I put that on LinkedIn, then all these people come out of the woodwork trying to pitch you. So then I took it off. Right? Yeah. The wheels oh, yeah. are turning, right? Yeah. And, um, but now, I mean, I sort of feel like I'll really, I'll really feel like an investor when I get my first like profitable exit. Actually, I think one of Zach Colius's um, investments is about to cash out, not hard, but like a two Xer. So then I'll have like that. But I, yeah. you know, my plan had been because I didn't think of myself as a real investor. Well, I'm going to angel invest and I'm going to have a couple of successes and then I'll go work at a, at a big VC company, right? Because I can show them, here's my resume. Like I don't have, you know, an accounting or business background, but I have, I've made these successful bets. And I then, can pick. I can yeah, choose. And, the, and the more that I do this, the more I'm like, why should I work for a VC? Yeah. What's the incentive? I mean, probably, yeah, you can be like, I have 75 X return or something like that and something crazy. Part of it was I thought I needed that for legitimacy. So I wouldn't feel like an imposter. And now I'm like, no. Nah. All right. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So go out like, a business card, it's real. But for me, it's like the reason I want to become an investor is to work less, not more. But if you go to a VC fund, you will work like, you know, until like the crazy hours around the clock just because they're a VC and they got to have like these returns because otherwise the, the fund loses money and 75% of VC funds worldwide, they lose money. They never return the money to the to the to investors, right? So it's like, why do you want to go in a, in a business that it's inherently bleeding money, right? <laughs> well, I'll send you this article and you can... Um... You can uh, show it in the in the. I'll final link it in the show notes. Yeah. But basically, it talks about how, in a in a sense, VC is they're so beholden to their returns that, like for example, you look at WeWork, people kept the board knew it had a problem, and it yeah. just kept letting Only that one. guy do whatever he wanted. And the VCs were like, "This does not make sense." But then they didn't want to lose. They didn't want to like lose their money, so they kept just going along with it. It's a great article about how basically it's their desire to not, uh, to have a return on their fund that made them, you know, prop up a failing business for so long. It's a great article. I'll send it to you. It's basically like how VC is breaking 
business. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that we, th I think it was linked to another one that was like, we sort of knew to re, we need to reinvest, uh, sorry, reinvent capitalism because we're breaking it with venture yeah, capital. That's exactly like it. That, yeah. uh, that was a really good one. That was a great, exactly. and that, it was just like, oh, you know, you, you know, things are kind of rigged, but that's like a real rig where basically, you know, a VC will, so let's say that I'm a competitor to WeWork. But I don't have, you know, Andreessen and Sequoia just, you know, fire hose money at me because, Correct, yeah. uh, you know, I don't have these kinds of investors who will do anything to not lose. Yeah. Even if my business is bad. So I can have, yeah. It's SoftBank. It's like SoftBank. They literally just invest a billion and, you know, it's like crazy yeah. ass bets. Yeah, they were, they were crazy. Anyways. I'm digressing a little bit here, but another thing that I wanted to comment on is the fact that uh, two other things here. Uh, first one, you you said something that I don't really agree with. You said like a anybody can uh, can become an angel investor. It's like wrong. You gotta have some money. Like um, <laughs> how how do you, yeah exactly. I mean, well, not really. Technically, not not really. Actually, if you're good, what you can do is like take a commission to for like fundraising for the startup and reinvest that commission, that fee into the startup. So you can start getting some money like that, but that's a very extremely rare case. You do it only if you have some credibility. So it's not very likely you're going to do it from the get go. But um, of course, we all have businesses. You might have have made money with your uh, past ventures, with your 18 years working in, in Silicon Valley, whatever. You pull in some money. How do you decide what amount of money you can invest every year? And what's the check size that you usually write? And how did you come to that conclusion? Um, that is a great question. So I only had... good questions here. Again, only good <laughs> questions. Uh, <laughs> once again, that's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so I, I made a bunch of money selling a house. I bought a house in San Francisco in 2005. I sold it 10 years later, you know. Good investment. And, and, you know, 100,000 plus. So at the time, so I'm just sitting on this money and, and I'm thinking, okay, well, if, if this is my amount kind of to gamble with or half of it, you know, that's sort of what I was initially thinking. Now, what wound up happening, of course, was, you know, you bet on something and then they come back to raise another round and you want to participate in the round. So suddenly this company that you were like, oh, I'll give them, you know, even up to 50 grand and suddenly if you want to stay at your level in their investment, now you got to pony up like 35,000 or whatever it is to keep, to keep your amount yeah. in the next round. And then suddenly I'm, you know, you're spending way more than you ever thought you would. Like, I, I feel like most of my money now, very, a lot of it is just to stay in because. So you follow know, one, you don't do oh, first yeah, money in, first money out, and you just cash out at the next round. So you, you follow on your investment. Oh, I do follow on. Yeah. And that's um, great. Because I'm, I'm investing at such an early level that when someone gets to Series A, and I think we've had three or maybe even four of our direct investments go to Series A, that means you've got all these Good. big guys putting in millions of dollars. So, of course, I want to stay in, even if it's expensive. So, sometimes it's quite expensive to, to sort of stay in. <clears throat> but again, once you've got, you know, these big VCs that are, that are betting on your company, you're like, I don't want to punk out now. I mean, you don't have to, but for all of them, we've done follow on. So then that consumes way more of the budget than we thought we had. Um, Cause for me, it was really complicated to, because first of all, there was no information. That's pretty, that's exactly not very <laughs> transparent. When you start investing, it's like, how do I get into deals? What's the sign? Of, what's the size of the check? Am I allowed to pitch in here? Because I don't know. Is that a thousand euros enough? It's like 2000 euros. It's like, I don't know if that that's really enough. Right. So, you don't have this kind of information. Of course, cap tables are not open. Of course, some people, there's a bit of gatekeeping as well, but also there's a bit of like, other part is people just don't know how to communicate it because I don't know, they never needed it. Like how, why do they want to expose it? Right. So in a sense, like for me, it was complicated to know whether this was a right amount of money. Like, I don't know, 2000 euros per deal. So maybe it's not good enough. You don't have even tax incentives at this point. Um, you don't own enough. You don't own enough of the company. Like maybe it's too much overhead, and the lawyers are gonna cost you more than the amount you're you're putting in, right? So it's kind of complicated. It takes like I don't know, like five to ten deals to sort of calibrate where you can create an impact there. 
um, I know that, you know, the relations and the, the numbers in Silicon Valley are vastly different, right? But um, so when you wired the, fir the first money, the first check, how did you feel? Like, do you remember that company? How, how did it feel? What kind of money was it? Uh, what were the conditions? Where did you fuck up as well? So. Oh, yeah. Well, the first one definitely was kind of a fuck up. Um, oh, really? Why? Was, was it like an invest yeah. in a friend just because he's a friend or? Exactly. We right. invested in a friend. Sorry. sorry. This person, he's not going to listen, so it's all right. <laughs> he's never going to listen. Uh, yeah, it was a friend and this uh, person had, had a very successful business um, in all marketing. Right. Like, you know, was very well known and had, you know, some high, some, some well-connected friends and it was $25,000, which was a lot. I mean, it was, I think before I ever did any of my first angel investing and you didn't have to be accredited or anything. It's just your friend that you're giving $25,000 to. Yeah. And then over the course of, you know, and, and, and this was one of those adventures where, so my husband who's dying to say hi to you, is it, is it okay if he's on here for a sec? Oh yeah, sure. I want to see him. I want to say hi. Yeah. Bring out that Kerry guy. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're just wearing spoke pants around here. But so, you know, we, this, uh, this person wasn't technical. Dorian's pretty technical. Um, I have done a lot of product management. So we tried really hard to help this founder. You know, we hooked um, them up with uh, developers. Um, we, you know, I went over the product plan, so many stuff, so many things, but at the end of the day, this person just wasn't technical enough. And so would sort of second guess the developers would want to do crazy things like approve work like an hour at a time. Cause you know, they were running out of money. And so that was one of those things where after watching this kind of flail for about a year, we're like, we're never going to see that money again. It's just gone. And we're still in touch uh, with this person. You know, we still have our agreement or whatever, but I just, nothing, I, it was a good learning experience. $25,000 is a lot of money to have to learn on. Um, yeah, but it's, it's pretty expensive. But then again, you would pay more for an MBA, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, totally. But yeah, this person, she just, she or he just couldn't take it over the finish line. And, and you realize that just because you're really, really successful when you've got a company around you, yeah. doesn't mean really, you can do all those parts. And if you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Uh, actually, speaking of which, this is a really good topic. And I want to follow up on that is learnings, things that you wish you had known from the very beginning, but it's kind of like expensive to learn a little bit later on. Like, for instance, paperwork. I didn't know investing requires so much paperwork and legalese and lawyers here and there. It's like so much management overhead. It's like totally not what I want to do. I thought it was just wiring money, sign a small oh. contract, and that's it. Not really. Like the amount of paperwork you had to do, even to sign like some really simple shit in early stage companies. How do you deal with that? Is that something you got to outsource? You got like a lawyer friend or... Well, so, you know, when you invest through a syndicate, they take care of all that for you, which is great. So yeah. the first time I That's did, good. like, so there's that first check to just the friend. And then there was another um, investment and uh, I was co-leading the round with nice. a VC, this VC called um, Unshackled. And their, their sort of value prop is, you know, Google and Facebook and all these people bring people over, um, with a work visa and you can never quit because your work visa is tied to them. And so what yeah. a check does, which is genius is you become their employee, they sponsor your visa and then you can work on your own company. Nice. Oh, that's which, very, I know really they're, it's, they're, it's a cool organization. So anyway, they, there was a company and I wanted to invest and they kind of were like, well, we'll invest however much you invest. And I said, okay, but, you guys are a real company and you've got the lawyers. Can you, can you write everything up? Then they wrote it up and I realized, I don't know if this is good or not. So I, just, I called a startup. I basically Googled startup uh, lawyers and I found a guy and, you know, nice. I put down, I don't know, a thousand dollars retainer or something like that. And I said, will you read this contract and tell me if it's good or not? That's a very <laughs> good was, investment. Yeah. And, and the, Unshackled told me we're giving you the exact same terms that we're giving ourselves. And I believed them, but I just didn't know, you know, I knew that there could be stuff in there that I wouldn't know was wrong. And, he, and the lawyer came back and said, this is the best like 
most favorable contract to you that I have ever seen. Like normally the VC oh, wow. grabs a little bit more, but this really is equal. And so that's how I did. I figured, you know, a thousand dollars now would be so much better spent on a lawyer than, you know, some kind of litigation later when it turns out I misunderstood the contract. Yeah. <laughs> how about, how about cash flow management? Cause that's something that for me, like it's become an issue right now. Because I'll tell you why. Now that I'm investing more, like at the beginning, I would do like two, three deals a year, right? It's, it's all right. You, yeah, you don't even care that much when you wire the money. When you start doing at least a deal per month, like I'm right now, I'm sitting at 25 investments, right? So like I'm more or less doing like one every month or every two months. So you commit that money, but then the round drags on and maybe you you receive like the the capital call is like six months down the line. So in your mind, you have already paid it, but the money's sitting at the bank. So you commit to other deals and then all of a sudden, like three or four come at the same time. It's like, wait, wait, wait what happened here? <laughs> yeah, so that's I mean, really hard for me to manage. Like, how do you manage that part as well? well Unless you're, to, you're rich. To all, that founders, to all founders, is don't try to raise during tax season in the United States. <laughs> like, I know. I'm just having exactly this. Like, this is, it's May, like next month, like, I gotta pay taxes for like last year. I was like, oh my God, I have like three or four investments I committed in November or December last year. And you're just like, yeah, sorry, the government gets this now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've How been, good? what we kind of do is like depending on stocks and other stuff that we have, like the market's been really good lately. We put, I put a lot yeah. of like my loose money in Wealthfront and it just does really well. Mm. So oops, that was Alexa. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes I'll look at my account and be like, oh, wow, like I have 14,000 extra dollars just because I, I let it sit there for a long time. Wealthfront is a, is a great passive investing uh, platform. And then other times, again, stuff comes up, like, for example, um, ugh, so Arlen Hamilton, I invested in Backstage Capital. She is the only VC that ever made me prove that I was accredited. Like yeah, Jason that's Cindy, why I, ca I can't invest in Arlen. Shout yeah. out to her, by the way. She's amazing. She's one amazing. On this podcast, on this podcast, she, she'll come to this podcast one of these days. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, the interesting thing is uh, her, the CEO, CEO uh, Christy Pitts, who I kind of knew, she was at Verizon, Ver Verizon Ventures. We never knew each other at Verizon, but when I was thinking about, like, how do I become a VC, I, I met with her, which is how I basically found out about Erlen. And she told me, like, the thing we like about you, Liz, is when you commit, like, you know, whatever it is, like $25,000, you just send it. Like a lot of people don't, we have to talk to them for a year and they still might punk out on the 25,000 that they promised us. And you just write the check. And I'm like, I didn't know that you were allowed to not do that. Like you mean people commit money and then they never give it to you. And she's like, Oh yeah. And I was like, Oh, but, um, <sighs> so anyway, she wants, uh, you know, there, she just did a new raise and I wanted to participate and you, to get accredited, you have to have a certain amount of like assets. And I had just bought a house. So I had just liquidated a bunch of stuff and yeah. given it to the realtor or whatever in the bank. So I didn't look that accredited really. Like I didn't look like I was rich enough because I just, you know, put this money towards a house. And I was just like, oh, this is such bad timing. Like if I would just done this like a month earlier before I wrote this big down payment check. And you know, that stuff is, uh, one thing that Arlen feels strongly about, and I think this is really cool. Um, and I think Jason Calacanis might be uh, working on this too, but figuring out a way for people who aren't accredited, cause you have to be kind of rich. You have to have either something like $350,000 a year in income, uh, for the last two years and you expect to have yeah. the same or you have to have a million dollars in assets not including real estate yeah but because they're regulated they have to have these sort of like stricter uh, rules to become to these sure, I get it. it just means right? that like you know me like in 2015 before i sold my house i mean even selling my house wouldn't have qualified me but i wouldn't have been able to do any of this and so uh, Arlen's working on a on, off this new platform called Republic, which is trying to basically yep. it's like basically crowdsourcing, kind of like Indiegogo was. Correct. But, yeah. But it's uh, it's for startups because I feel like part of the reason that people got so 
uh, not people, like young people who want to play. They got really into Robinhood. They got really into crypto because suddenly they could gamble. And it is gambling. Right. And I understand that the SEC wants to make sure that you know that you're gambling. But it seems like a rich person would be would need much less handholding than a young person. But now they're like, oh, yeah, just trade stocks all day. Trade GameStop. Do whatever you want. Like, that's okay. Dogecoin. <laughs> exactly. I do think it's a... Uh, I think it's ironic. So, it is ironic. But anyway, timing sucks a lot. Um, there are deals that I've just had to say no to because I'm broke at the at the time. You know, know, money comes in, money goes out. But in general, I haven't been super strict. Um, one of the things I sort of liked about Jason's book also, and it, and Arlen Hamilton's book is great too, uh, called yeah. "It's About Going Time." But it's a really great book. But it's like it doesn't contain that much advice for for investing. It's it's yeah. much more of an inspirational story, but it really it's like bad. it's a transformational book. It's an eye opening book, especially for people of not their background, perhaps, right? People like me. It was like, wow, she literally had to punch her way into like a radically distinct different culture, right? So I mean, one thing I got from her and Jason is you just you if you know that that you're good yeah just keep punching like as soon as in your head you've got the confidence like i know better than andreessen horowitz i mean i worked with a bunch of big vcs before and I, sometimes i think i do know better than them and i believe that about myself yeah i mean like uh, bo both people have got something in common right they were not wanted in this school people club which is called investment silicon valley investment i mean you know, in the case of Arlen, it's even, it's even more yeah. radical because she's a black queer woman, right? And that's and also, she's super from different, Texas, right? And she was living in LA. Like those things are like Silicon Valley is allergic Boom. to that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the funny thing about Jason Calacan is just a funny accent and a completely outdated haircut. But like, uh, he's still a white heterosexual male, right? So there's right. no reason that why he wouldn't be accepted. But they seem to me... People like they want to be part of the clubs that they don't they don't get invited to, right? So um, and they're like, I, I get incentivized by that, and so they thrive in that kind of. In I that also kind of. felt like neither of them uh, approached it as well. I've got a spreadsheet, and this is how much of my assets I'm going to allocate, and this is how I'm going to do my my money flow. Jason was putting um, burgers for a living in in. <laughs> In New York, and I was like, "Wow, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a self-made man, right? No <laughs> Elon Musk, no son of rich people. It's like he was literally doing that for a living." And they were sort of just making it up as they went along, and that's kind of what I'm doing. Like, if I have some money and there's a great company, then like my thesis is more: Do I believe in this founder? And I don't have like it's not like you know, at Tiger Global, you've got this much amount of money that you have to deploy. Like, you don't want to be sitting on it. You know, I'm able to just be way more loosey goosey with the whole thing and and be a little bit more listening to my gut, which is also what you know Arlen and I think Jason both did, where they listened to their gut. Correct. And um they hustled, they worked hard, but eventually they made it. And that, like precisely what they created, and I think that that's very inspirational, they created these role models. It's not like I say, I want to be like Jason Calacanis or Arlen, like uh, I don't need role models for that, right? But they are creating new generations of business angels who precisely before them, before they democratize it, before they open it up, they didn't have any sort of role model. And now they're like, yeah, I want to be like them. And I think that's going to bring a lot of interesting people to this landscape. Because before oh, that, yeah. it was just rich folks, right? I was like, well, yeah, son, like son of a CEO, son of an investor. And like, oh, my God, you know. yeah. Like the Drapers. <clears throat> but, you yeah. know, <laughs> like the, 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 the most famous woman VC was like Esther Dyson and there was one other lady, you know, this is like in the 90s. Some partners in, oh uh, yeah, no, I mean, so like exactly. you're talking and, in the 90s, yeah. like, I didn't, I mean, Esther Dyson is her own, you know, she's, she's a genius at certain things. And so I couldn't pattern myself after her. And I, I do think that people like us who have seen um, successful people stay successful, fail up, not because of just because they were in the right place, you know, like I'm, yeah. you know, the son of the Sequoia guy. And now I just have this career. Even if I fail, I, I fail up. And, you know, I don't have that luxury. I'm sure you don't have that luxury. 
Uh, Arlen certainly Not really. (laughs) (laughs) Many, 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 many times in my life, I had to borrow money to pay for rent back in the day. So especially when starting the company, like these, most of these investors, they, they never, they never had less than six figures in their bank. Can I, yeah, can I tell you a story, which is a, a friend ahead, of mine yeah. started this company, and it wound up getting bought by a firm, which is um, Peter Thiel. But basically, his app, for people that are broke, you know when your paycheck is coming in or whatever it is, and you know what your fixed costs are, like you've got cable or internet or whatever. And it'll tell you, the app just told you, how much money today could I spend? Like, today you have $2.00. Period. Yeah, not a lot of money you can spend. No business angel for you. <laughs> well, and he, he took it to all the big VCs and they all said no because they were like, how can somebody only have $2 until their next paycheck? And it's like pretty easily. I mean, Precisely. And I think one, one of the investments that Arlen and her, you know, backstage VC are backing is something like that, right? It's like uh, money allocation for people living on, you know, uh, like very, very low salaries or not even fixed income and all of that. And like VCs wouldn't back that. But like, for instance, one of the, like I'm part of a fund here in Barcelona, it's called Indic Fund. And we backed a company that what's doing is like, you can receive your salary whenever you need it. Like not at the end of the month, not when the company decides to pay for it. It's like, of course they take, they take a cut. But if you want to receive 50% of it, like let's say in the second week of the month, you can get it now. And then the other half at the end of the month. And uh, VC, pe- VC, VC people would be like, why do you need that for? And I was like, people like uh, my background, for a very humble background back in the day, I would have really needed that. Like, oh, well, and also, the, you know, the banking system really penalizes. There's a there's a tax to being poor where you bounce a check, it's 30 bucks. Well, I only yeah. bounced a check because I didn't get paid yet. But now I have an extra, you know, 30 bucks I got to pay because I bounced a check because I didn't know exactly, you know, what was going to land when. And, you know, one thing that I like a lot about going to backstage VC demo days is a lot of people that she invests in are solving problems that, e- that you know, I mean, I've been broke, but like that I didn't know about. For example, there was this... Uh, <laughs> how, they, how, do you, how don't you know about being broke? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I've been broke, but yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I always could have got like moved home with my parents. Like I was never like out on the yeah. street. But like, you know, if you're... It, you know, moving back with my parents sounded so much worse than just busting my ass. <laughs> but anyway, like, like for example, there's, you know, a guy that's trying to change the way voting happens in, 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 in rural districts, like getting people elected to super local, hyper local things will help the whole state. And he lives in a Southern state. And I don't think about that stuff. Like, oh yeah, your town has 500 people in it, but you still get to elect a judge. It's yeah. fascinating. And then one thing I also didn't know is apparently in certain communities, a lot of people just don't even have a bank account. They don't trust the banks. Don't blame them. And so, you know, it, it's like a lot of remittance payments, but how, how can you, these people are looking at an, at an addressable market that I didn't know about because I live in a bubble. You know, I've lived in New York city. I've lived in Santa Cruz, California, Berkeley, California, Oakland, California, and now Seattle. Like I just live in this bubble and I love these founders that are solving problems for people that, you know, I, I mean, it makes sense that it, it all makes sense. It's just something I hadn't thought of. And that's one of the reasons why I love her thesis so much is, you know, what Se- what the Sequoia, like, you know, partner thinks isn't a, an addressable market. I, I guarantee you it is. <laughs> Couple of questions to wrap this up because it's already we've been already talking for an hour. Uh, so we're really thankful for that. Couple of questions to wrap this up. First off, like you co-created this company, which I take it as to co- like to share investments with your husband, right? LCDC. Um, <laughs> at what point? At what point do you really need a company to track or manage your investments instead of doing a, them on a personal level? Um, well, that's a good question. So. You know, we kind of keep saying when we have a big exit. So uh, I think right. I told you we've one of the people that we invested in, and the thing that we're lucky we're lucky because we've worked in Silicon Valley, so we know really smart people that have done you know successful things. And so we have this one guy in uh, Australia, and we think that he's going to be our first exit, and we anticipate that it'll be good. He's super smart, and he's doing something really interesting. So it's like once we get our big check, I think that's. Like, let's say we got 
seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Um, then I think we have to think about that. <laughs> the next level. But you had already created it, right? Because you, you've been you've been having it for like four years. At least that's where I ran on your LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. So LCTC. I mean, when Trump. Um, did all these weird little tax things. We knew that they were uh, gonna right. just for rich people, right? So we set up our LLC because basically I can say, oh, you know, this money that came in through my, I'm not, don't listen to this IRS. This is not about you. But you know, it's basically a structure. It's a structure to, to, to change the way certain payments are taxed. Um, It would be fun to be more legit. Like, I think it's so interesting what Mackenzie uh, Bezos has done, and maybe Melinda Gates will do this too, where, you know, she basically got a, a, a board of advisors to help her decide where to, where to give the money. She just writes them a check directly. She doesn't have a bunch of structures. She's not asking people to name buildings after her or any of that other BS. Yeah. But she basically, she doesn't have like, I don't think she has an office. She just has a bunch of advisors who know you know more than she does about stuff that could really benefit communities across the united states and it, it might be fun if we had the money i mean oh, we probably won't get to where Mackenzie bezos is soon but you know, <laughs> not yet not yet like eventually that. you'll get there but yeah um, i mean I, i like her style in that she she gave instead of like she's she picks places and and organizations that would really change the trajectory of people's lives like like historically black colleges you know i mean uh kamala Hart harris went to a historically black college and you know yep. the, those institutions are making a huge difference in in making society a little more equal okay uh we like to wrap it up by asking the signature question but i feel like you have already answered because the signature question of this podcast is what's your biggest fuck up and can you quantify it with money It seems like that first investment might have been your fuck up, but I don't know if you're like, that's the biggest investment fuck up you've done so far. Is there any other story you want to share real quick? I mean, I can tell you a big fuck up from my past, which is I used to sit next to Pierre Omidivar who founded eBay and he was yeah. with General Magic and he was telling me about it. And I was like, that would never work. <laughs> Who wants to buy a bunch of little Pez dispensers like online? But again, this is like 1994. So the whole idea of a platform of like a, of a C2C platform, he thought that up. So he's smarter than I am. But that's probably my biggest fuck up thinking. I didn't say that. I was like, go Pierre, you, you, good for you. Can you imagine that had you not told him that he wouldn't have created it? Well, like, so maybe I don't you think contributed I to the creation of eBay. <laughs> Um, well, it's funny because for a while, his eBay's first offices were in the same building as my dad's offices. And I would just go see him, you know, whenever I'd go see my dad, I'd say, hey, Pierre, what's up? Oh, look, you guys are really going. And it, <laughs> yeah, so it he's super smart. He didn't need my approval. Let me tell you that. If, if I had said, oh, this sounds like a dumb idea, that wouldn't have stopped him. He had had that idea for a long time. And um, so that's probably <laughs> my biggest fuck up is just I couldn't see the future back then. But that's all right. But then you have proven that you have seen the future in other things and you will prove it by, you know, through the investments that you have done so far. Real quick, one last minute for you. You've got this camera, this microphone of yours to tell us how, what are you working on? What's going on in your life? How can we help you? Last minute. Um, I, uh, this is terrible. I don't really have an answer. Like I'm good. I, I feel like between. I'm happy for you that you don't need anything. That's good. <laughs> like, At least we've never had this answer. So <laughs> like my thesis is just bet on great people, and you know, so great. through through Arlen's through my investment with Arlen, but also just people coming to us and just us being like, you're a great person. Like you can you can get this done. That is so empowering because I mean, you were saying this the other day. It's like Robin Hood. It's like okay, I've done well, but now I want to like make everyone do well, especially, you know, people that aren't set up to do well in the current system. Or maybe you can finish by saying what kind of investments do you do? Like what kind of startups do you like seeing and what kind of, you know, what kind of companies can we send your way? Oh, I definitely, I definitely like women um, led or women founded or co-founded because again, they just get overlooked so frequently just we send out different like signals and i think 
uh, a lot of male VCs are like, oh, she's not really a go-getter. It's like, I don't need to be a go-getter in the way that you think people, like I don't have to be full of bluster. Like maybe I just know what I'm doing and I'm soft-spoken. And so I do like that. Also, we've got um, a couple of investments uh, for people of color. I think the same thing, like they, you know, yeah. One of them, he's African American. He walks in a room, and of course, he has imposter syndrome. And he went to Stanford, but he just knows that you know there's a certain amount of pattern matching. And I like to bet on people like that because because they're they're worth it. And I want to change, you know, the the power dynamics in the world. Let's contribute to change. That that brings this to a close. At least I'm happy. Like we're we're closing with a very positive note. So thank you for that. Thank you for your time. It's been fantastic. So uh, also thank you everybody for listening to this episode. See you on the next episode. Bye.